before as much as saying priorities, etc., etc. My question is about political will. Mm -hmm. We know where um, Europe is at at the moment, and it seems to me that most governments now have a very important job of jobs for people and livelihoods and all of that. I'm just wondering, do you believe that the Europeans have the political will? to really want to continue the journey that you're about and your team are about, and that they're going to keep that at the heart of what we're about, and not, as it were, saving ourselves, etc., etc. et cetera. Mm. Mm -hmm. Gentleman mm -hmm. behind in the white shirt there, yes. And have I a third hand anywhere? Uh, hello, my name is Graham Easton. I'm a lecturer in um, school of business and um, with the Humanitarian Logistics Institute. Um, my query, I, I completely agree with everything the Commissioner had said. I'm drawn to your two priorities about anticipating crisis and the uh, professionalism. Um, and obviously, my background being in logistics and the importance mm -hmm. of logistics and the role it plays in humanitarian mm -hmm. operations. Um, one of the things that comes up time and again when I go to conferences, academic conferences, is the lack of funding that goes into training preparation for humanitarian mm -hmm. agencies. Yep. They only get the funding, obviously, when the crisis arises from the public. Is there a mechanism, or will you be offering a mechanism to provide funding and training for the NGOs, which, as you're saying there, the preparation phase could assist and could cut down costs as well? Thank you very much. Is there a third person at this stage? No? Yes, I see another hand there, yeah, and we'll just take those three interventions here. Yeah. Hi, uh, Tom McDermott, I'm a PhD researcher at Trinity College. Um, I have two, two questions. Uh, the first is related to the criteria that are used to Define humanitarian disaster. Mm -hmm. When do you officially yeah. recognise that an event or a situation becomes a disaster? And I suppose specifically, you talked about Libya and Syria. Have they officially been recognised? And at what point do they become recognised? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And Thank also, you. could a, could an economic crisis be recognised as a humanitarian disaster? So I'm mm -hmm. thinking of somewhere like Greece at the moment. Could mm -hmm. that be a humanitarian disaster? Yeah. And my other point is just in relation to. Um, your priority of anticipating disasters. Do you see any uh, potential to link early warning systems to some kind of automated response mechanism? I'm thinking mm -hmm. in the private sector you have weather indexed insurance. Could we have mm -hmm. weather indexed aid programs or something? Yep. Like Thank you very much. Three very interesting interventions yep. there, Commissioner. Now, and Joe, <coughs> Joe, and on the name. Okay. Um, I'll try to Could match. We have the, the, the mic, the roving I mic. Can, try can you manage? You. Okay, yep. you match. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you're a politician too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, let me have the, uh, yeah. the microphone. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure the minister would have uh, his own views on political will. Uh, Europeans, European citizens, remain committed to help people in their most dire moment of need. Four out of five Europeans say they want us to provide humanitarian assistance to people devastated by disasters or conflicts. And this is a very small drop vis-a-vis -vis the time before the crisis. But with the same token, citizens expect more from us. They expect to do more with their uh, sacrifice. And they expect focus on results. So when I started as a commissioner, Probably if you were to ask me, what did you do last year? I would say last year we did programs and projects for 1.1 billion euros, which is what we did. When you ask me now, I would say, maybe I would start with the same, but I would say we have touched the lives of nearly 150 million people around the world, providing food and water and shelter and protection and medical care. And I would be able to then drill down and say, what, what is it that we do? We now are providing assistance for the Sahel. As, as the minister announced, uh, this is a big uh, a looming crisis. Uh, we, the commission, we are providing 275 million euros of humanitarian aid and development assistance. With this money, we are going to get more than a million kids to benefit we are going to get 500,000 pregnant women to benefit. And we can go through the, we can say, 7 million in total will, will be touched by this funding of people affected by the disaster. So that accountability is what I think has uh, changed, not the will. If we don't manage to deliver this focus on results, I worry that the support of our population may, may go down. 
we also need to be clear that stability in places like the Sahel is relevant for us. If Mali and Mauritania and northern Nigeria and then Chad and Niger, if they fall into a path of insecurity, it's going to come and bite us. So, but but this is this is the logical argument we have to we have to put in front of people regularly and in a credible uh, way. Uh, I I am um, very much in favor of having programs that have the uh, longer term capacity in mind. In uh, in our program, one of the legislations we will be passing is for volunteer humanitarian corp for Europe. And there, the emphasis is on selecting and training volunteers, and then, of course, deploying volunteers. We today have eco funds that go to support capacity in uh, NGOs. Not huge amounts, but they are there. And more importantly, 8 to 10 percent of our money is invested in disaster risk reduction. These are activities that help us to learn how to bring down the, they are basically learning uh, training activities. Mm -hmm. Where we still fail is in our ability to recognize the role of prepositioning, logistics, delivery. There is still debate in this area. I'm sure you're aware of it. And it is important that this debate kind of brings, brings uh, results. Uh, how we define disasters? Of, of course, we look at the uh, people at risk, population at risk. Uh, um, in, in a conflict, it would be um, how many people die. I mean, are there people live, uh, being, you know, lo lives lost? How many are displaced? How many are at risk? Uh, in a natural disaster, similarly, we would look at the, at, the, uh, at the population at risk, and we would look at can we help people? And on that basis, we make decisions. For Syria, we just made a 3 million funding decision on February 3rd because we uh, uh, qualified this to be a uh, uh, humanitarian emergency. It goes for ambulances, uh, medical care, but also for support potentially for refugees that are likely to, to go up. Um, Greece, I would not qualify as a humanitarian disaster. I mean, I, I go to places where the, the it, 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 you know, being a humanitarian commissioner actually helps to see our, our own crisis in Europe with a different uh, pair of eyes. Uh, um, of course, if we have an economic crisis that leads to, to truly devastating uh, consequences of, of a magnitude, uh, uh, you know, obviously it is very difficult for the Greek people. I don't want to under, understate it. But Europe is rich. We have to be very honest with ourselves. Even with our crisis, we are rich. Not only materially rich, rich. we have institutions, rule of law, we have the accumulated well, the knowledge, the skills, we are in a little bit of a mess because Europe has lived beyond its uh, means for a while. Mm -hmm. Not each country, not every in each country, but collectively we spend more than we earned. So now we have to buckle up. I mean, in Eastern Europe we went through that and it was very painful. It was very painful, but we came out of it stronger and more competitive. Uh, so I, I, you know, I would be careful to put the, and in, 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 in fairness to Greece, uh, part of the problem in, in Greece, to be very blunt, is that the politicians of Greece have not been able to create a platform for national unity in the face mm -hmm. of crisis. Here in Ireland, I think people have done it. It is still painful, but, but there is a much stronger sense of, of, of we are going to pull, go through this, we will pull uh, out of this crisis. Now, we can go through the reasons why it happened point fingers. In my job, pointing fingers should come last. Let's get out of the mess and then come to, you know, assessing Assess. what happened and how it happened. Um, so that would be my, 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 my take on it. And on early warning system, you have a very good point, a very good point. We are doing better because after, especially after the tsunami, there is much more invested in early warning uh, systems. But we are not where we should be in, in, in 
integrating what they tell us for action, take this ahead. Early warnings are saying there, may, there is trouble uh, coming, but it hasn't yet arrived. Mm -hmm. And there is this risk. I mean, why do we need to wait until kids die to say, ah, it's a crisis? Uh, the, the, there, I think we we still have we still have a way uh, to go to make early warning systems a decision making tool of the kind they should they should be. Yeah, just as recently as yesterday on a radio program, um, the comment came up about Greece and the fact that their their economic crisis is leading to people not being able to get the most basic of medicines and some NGOs. Um, medical NGOs have moved in now so it's entirely possible that if they're already in the system they may come looking for some assistance from development aid budgets because it, products like insulin are not being given, not being made available even to diabetics so that's got, got to a very basic nature so we, we yeah. might see can, something can like actually, that, we would ask the minister yeah, as well. Yeah. Yes. I, I just want to correct myself of course if there are people who suffer we have to, there is always, never mind rich or poor society, there has to be room for compassion. So don't ma get my answer to say, mm, because we, we did provide help to Japan, it's mm. a rich country. I'm not saying never ever, I, when I look at Greece, they are our neighbors. I mean, we live, live door, door to door. I think there is more resilience in the Greek society uh, that kind of meets the, meets mm. the eye, and, and, I, and I'm more confident. <coughs> yeah. Just on Mary's question uh, in relation to the political will, um, I think the political will is strong, is very strong still here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. There isn't, there isn't any question there, despite the uh, economic crisis that mm -hmm. we have experienced, which I suppose just shows the robustness that is out amongst the public in general, and the awareness of humanitarian disasters and the need for aid and also the need for development. I suppose, in a broader sense, in the European Union, we have heard some mutterings of one or two countries here and there who are questioning um, the, the, the appropriateness of uh, meeting targets, UN targets, etc., EU targets, in the context of the economic crisis. Uh, but I don't think there's anything, as far as I can gather, and the, the Commissioner obviously knows the situation much better, that there is anything uh, substantial in that respect. But what I do think that it does it behoves all of us uh, to make sure, again as the Commissioner was saying, that how we use the aid is uh, better with less, uh, it is used more professional, greater coordination in relation to the NGOs, in relation to the, the countries, bilateral aid, better, co better coordination in relation to multilateral aid, better professionals in terms of training, the other question that was raised, um, and the awareness and that people are able to see that this is effective, that the outcomes are effective, and that it's not just um, a once-off thing, that there is some pathway through so that you look when you provide the humanitarian aid on an emergency basis, that you're going to step farther to try and provide development sustainable and is going to allow a situation whereby this will not arise again, this disaster will arise. And I think once that is done, people are very logical and they will see the situation and they're very compassionate. Uh, and I think the situation can be uh, the, the whole area of um, whether or not people are still prepared to make the contribution. I think there's no question about it at all. One last point, uh, and that is in relation to what Nora was saying there about um, the Department of Foreign Affairs has has uh, humanitarian teams. We do have a rapid deployment uh, core in place. And of course, as well as there being um, uh, humanitarian teams to act very quickly in emergency, there are humanitarian hubs around about where there's a supply stockpiled and uh, available for, for distribution and that various countries will share their supplies and various NGOs so that there can be a very rapid deployment. So I think all of that's extremely important. And I think the Commissioner may know that we are uh, pursuing the possibility of having such a humanitarian hub in Shannon. And we're looking at a feasibility study on that to see how, what we might do in Ireland in this respect. 
So we're looking forward to looking forward to talking to the Commissioner about this later on, but also looking forward to developing this on a feasibility basis. Thank you. Particularly encouraged by your attitude of neutrality, and I understand the importance of it because I've been working on it firsthand in Haiti in terms of access. Mm -hmm. um, and the area that I've been working in is a partnership program between peace building and human humanitarian aid. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the tension that can exist and the differences of approaches between peace building and humanitarian aid. Because I've been out in Haiti for six years and initially was advising out there in conflict in communities. I've worked with gang members, so I've been working with Aristide's exes. Um, and with a new, an attitude of neutrality, have access and sit down with the gang members and have brought them to Ireland as well. But one of the things post-earthquake that obviously came into play was the humanitarian approach created a lot of conflict. I think we're all aware of it. And most of my efforts in the last three mm -hmm. years have been about advising on reducing the conflicts in the tensions that exist between a peace-building process, which is a long-term intervention, and a humanitarian aid approach, which can be short-term. Okay. Thank you very much. And yep. Definitely his hands. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. My name is Hans Sommer. I head up DOCUS, the uh, umbrella group of Irish Development NGOs, one of the mechanisms that NGOs use to increase their cooperation and coordination. And I also thank you very much for your contribution and also for, thank you very much for your uh, availability to meet with the NGOs this morning. Uh, I know you're meeting with the Minister and you're meeting with our um, Rock Committee on Foreign Affairs Committee, and I, I think that you're saying three things to them today. Uh, one is thank you very much, and I really appreciate that, that message. That was a really important message that people in Ireland need to hear. Um, I think you said also very much a clear message about acting early uh, and the, the, the wisdom of investing in prevention rather than in responding to crisis. And I think there's a very strong third message that you have for us today around the, the importance of humanitarian principles. And I suppose that's the one I'm most worried about, and certainly our members would be wor worried about uh, a pressure being out there in, in the European Union member states on the humanitarian principles, and I wonder if you can you know, um, set us uh, straight on that basis. Thank you very much. Yep. You can hand the microphone back up here. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you for the, um, uh, for the uh, questions. Uh, on Haiti, uh, when I arrived there after the earthquake, and we traveled around, we visited uh, devastated areas. My first thought was that as terrible this earthquake was, and it was terrible, terrible, it wasn't Haiti's biggest problem. Haiti's biggest problem are the decades of no development, the <coughs> conflicts that have been boiling and of course got unleashed, and that to get to, to, get to the uh, point of stability, this is going to be a long, long haul. And it's not going to be three years and five years, as some of those who came in New York to support Haiti were hoping. It's going to be longer. Uh, I do believe that there is more we can do to build bridges between the humanitarian community. That has a very clear mandate, save lives and the development community, those like you who work on resilience, on, on basically building social strength. Because for us in the humanitarian world, it is not good enough to save a life. We want to see this life worth, worth living. And for this reason, I personally strongly believe in the need to talk to groups that have different mandates and seek where we can actually unite around a common goal. And the common goal, of course, is a more stable, more prosperous uh, uh, world that is a better place for our children to, 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 to live. Not easy, though. Not easy. And we, we actually had a lunch discussion that very difficult to build horizontal connections, you know. Much easier to take your mandate and run with it. But we all have an obligation to do better. And, and, and as the crisis is forcing us, the economic crisis is forcing us to be more competitive, leaner, hopefully it would force us to be more connected 
on the development uh, uh, side. And you, you can count on us being, being uh, on that, uh, that issue. On the principles, uh, we in Europe, with the, creation, with, with, Lisbon, with the Lisbon Treaty, we created two things, the External Action Service and an independent humanitarian aid commissioner. And the latter, my position, it is to provide neutrality and independence of humanitarian aid and protect it. There have been some, some leanings, <laughs> but it is now very clear that humanitarian action is outside of the external action <coughs> service. It is neutral and independent. And it is based on principles. But we have to continue to work on those. And again, I might turn to the minister later today, as we discuss the future presidency, what we can do together for this value proposition of Europe. Because I'll tell you, I actually believe that not only morally this is the right thing to do, but it is beneficial for Europe because it puts Europe on higher standing. And I see it when I talk to people. I see the respect they have for Europe for being able to do the right thing just because it is the right thing to do, not for any political gains, not for contracts, not for influence. Uh, and I think we would do a huge disservice to our citizens if we step back from these principles. And we need to work, work on, on getting the general public to understand why they're important. And I would admit, when I came from the World Bank to become a commissioner, I knew the theory. But it is a very different thing now to know the practice. And I think we have a job to do to share this. Uh, and make it understandable to, to, to each and every one of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Commissioner. Well, we're coming to the end of, of our meeting here. Just listening to the Commissioner in her last statement there, it strikes me if there's any kind of silver cloud or silver lining to the economic crisis we're going through, it has forced our European leaders to talk horizontally as well as in their own uh, little niche or their own little country. So perhaps that dialogue has been uh, a starting point and will continue on. Nobody is an island on their own and I think if ever we wanted to see the world as, as one big village, we have seen it in the last two or three years in the policies and the dialogue that has to be going on between leaders. I want on all your behalfs to thank First of all, all of you for attending here today for the very interesting submissions and questions put in. I want to thank the management team here in the Volunteer Centre for allowing us to use this venue, which is a very suitable venue, appropriate venue to have had this discussion. I want to thank the Institute of International and European Affairs for their cooperation with the Irish Aid section of the Department of Foreign Affairs. For, for this theme of, of debates that will be ongoing in the Institute. Um, and I particularly want to thank Minister Joe Costello for being here because that shows just what his interest is, that he's not off doing something else, that he's had the time to be here to listen to both the Commissioner and to all of you. And I particularly want to thank Commissioner. Uh, I think uh, we have all been very impressed with her knowledge, her passion, her interest, and her practicality, I think, is uh, maybe I could say this. I mean, women are practical <laughs> creatures. <laughs> and, and I think you saw a very good demonstration of that today. Uh, a woman from Bulgaria, a country that a lot of us wouldn't know a great deal about, so we're extremely impressed. Very with beautiful you. country. Very beautiful, yes. People have been there on holidays. And so I want, on all your behalf, to thank the Commissioner for giving us her time today, for her passion and her knowledge and her expertise. And I hope and I think we will all go away renewed in whatever aspect of development work we might be involved in uh, as a result of your talk today and as a result of the Minister. So thank you all very much. Thank you.